This is Night City, the futuristic metropolis which is home to most of the action taking place in Cyberpunk 2077, which has quickly become the most popular PC benchmarking software in 2020. There are a few reasons I wanted to explore the economy of this fictional world. For starters, I gotta cash in on a subject that's top of Google Trends. It's been a while since I've done a virtual economy, I need a way to class my new gaming PC as a business expense, and of course, it's actually genuinely very interesting. Part of the appeal of this game was the way that it wove an alternative reality in with the themes and events that are taking place in our modern world to build an economy that both feels abstract, but also entirely possible. The virtual economy then builds the framework of an immersive world that is equally realistic and fanciful. The world of Cyberpunk 2077 is a cautionary dystopian tale that takes modern economic issues like wealth inequality, corporate influence, white collar corruption, militarization, black market dealings and even environmental degradation, and then turns those headlines up to a whole new level to let people experience making their way through a world where these problems go unchecked. It also goes without saying that this game has made headlines for a host of technical issues that have perhaps continued the theme of shining a light on economic problems in the real world. So, the economics of Cyberpunk 2077 is a great case study for lots of weird and wonderful economic happenings. How did the economy of this virtual world get to where it is in the year 2077? What are the key components of Night City's economy? And, a bit of a tangent, what business decisions led to the chaos surrounding the game's launch? Oh, and Cyberpunk 2077 technically takes part in an independent city-state, so you know what? Hey, may as well throw it on the Economics Explained national leaderboard. Oh, and a little disclaimer, this video will not have any spoilers relevant to the plot, so don't worry for all of you that haven't been able to play the game yet, which is basically everybody. This episode of Economics Explained was made possible by our fans on Patreon. If you would like to gain early access to these videos before they're uploaded to YouTube, as well as participate in exclusive Q&A sessions, which are now held every Saturday at 9.30 Eastern Standard Time, please consider supporting our channel at patreon.com slash economics explained. Cyberpunk 2077 actually takes place in our own world in a form of alternative history where a few distinct changes in our past led to some very unfortunate results in our future. The basic history is that in the late 20th century, the CIA, FBI, NSA and the DEA all teamed up together to form the Gang of Four, which would go on to wield significant political influence over the United States and therefore the world. These organisations were no longer beholden to the government in which they served and were able to put figureheads in place to ensure that their operations could be carried out undisturbed. This influence culminated in a war on drugs being taken to a level so extreme that it eventuated in an all-out conflict in Central and South America. The governments and cartels on the receiving end of this invasion retaliated by setting off a nuclear weapon in New York City, which is the centre of world finance. Taking out these massive stock exchanges caused worldwide panic as no one was able to realise the assets that they had held in their company equity. What's actually really interesting is that the Nasdaq and the New York Stock Exchange, the two largest securities exchanges in New York City and the world, are actually totally prepared for this exact scenario. The Intercontinental Exchange is the company that owns the NYSE, and in their investment prospectus they detail contingencies in place to ensure that ownership records and trading functionality remain in a situation where New York does not. For what it's worth, these days the main data centre that makes these exchanges tick is not in Manhattan. It's not even in New York, city or state. It's just across the border in some nondescript warehouse in New Jersey. Nonetheless, losing this financial centre was obviously a huge blow to the confidence people had in the US economy and this event kicked off a massive collapse that made the Great Depression look insignificant in comparison. Now this is actually quite unlikely, and while an event like this will cause economic turmoil, and for what it's worth it has caused economic turmoil, it is something that could be recovered, especially with our modern understanding of fiscal stimulus, which was something that we lacked back in 1929. Although it is hard to predict the alternative past, so who knows what kind of political mismanagement could have accelerated this collapse, especially with the Gang of Four pulling the strings. The eventual outcome of this economic downturn was that the United States became effectively a failed state, which was reflected in the US dollar falling out of favour as the world's reserve currency and being replaced by the Euro dollar, which was the fictional equivalent of, well, you know, the Euro, which was controlled by a far more stable region at the time. This is a really interesting detail in the game because it shows the potential outcome of the US dollar falling out of grace as the world's reserve currency. We have explored this concept a few times on the channel before and I will leave a link in the video description to a few videos that cover this topic in a lot more detail, but needless to say, 
that currencies are much more than just tokens of exchange in our modern economies. Running a country using the currency of another sovereign region or nation is possible, but it's far from ideal. Some nations like Vatican City or Monaco just use a foreign currency for convenience. The expense and difficulty in creating their own currency outweigh the benefits of being able to conduct their own monetary policy. Then of course there are nations like Venezuela that have been forced into adopting the US dollar because their own currency has been made more or less useless through reckless hyperinflation. Interestingly enough, this alternative United States in the year 2077 used a combination of their own currency and Eurobucks. The closest real world equivalent to this today is Argentina where the Argentine peso will be used for basic day to day transactions but major financial transactions like buying a house or a car or even getting paid will normally be done in US dollars. Video on Argentina coming soon by the way so you know like, subscribe, comment and all that good stuff. Anyway, this global turmoil festered over the decades and the world saw widespread man made plagues, massive natural disasters, tyrannical presidents and ongoing trade and physical wars between world superpowers. Think 2020 but twice as bad and then repeated every year for 50 years. Oh and if you think this is just a direct parody of our current predicament, remember this video game started development 8 years ago and it's based off a board game that came out in 1990. The original name of that board game was Cyberpunk 2020. You can't make this stuff up. Ominous foreshadowing aside, this global turmoil created a power vacuum that was quickly filled by the age of megacorporations. There is an interesting theory in economics and political science that power gravitates over time towards more authoritarian institutions with fewer people to answer to. Of course, it is just a theory, but especially during times of extreme turbulence, an institution like a large corporation is able to seize power a lot more effectively than say, a government that is beholden to internal bureaucracy and those pesky checks and balances. I have recommended it before, but if you haven't already seen it, go and watch CGP Grey's video called Rules for Rulers, he explains this theory far better than I ever could. Regardless, after years of failing governments, gangs controlling the streets and widespread unemployment, a host of megacorporations rose to prominence and became the true powers operating in the United States. These corporations controlled everything from basic municipal services all the way up to military and emergency services as well as the net. The net is analogous to the internet in our modern world, but remember this fictional world was originally perceived back in the 1980s, so again it's pretty remarkable how much they got right. Of course, the net of Cyberpunk 2077 is set far in the future and controlled exclusively by these mega corporations which use it to monitor, track and collect information about everybody who uses it. Everybody from potential customers or corporate rivals all the way up to their own employees are constantly monitored all to drive more sales, quash competition and weed out insubordination respectively. Now I know, a world of mega corporations that control everything and monitor our lives 24 7 using the internet, pretty hard to imagine right? Well everything so far might be par for the course, but what was a bit different was that one of these companies effectively founded their own sovereign city nation called Coronado City. This city was founded in modern day California which had also claimed independence from the greater United States. This city was built as a haven for trade and business that was meant to be sheltered from the crime and instability that was plaguing the world at the time. It was developed by Knight International in collaboration with a selection of other mega corporations as an administrative centre for corporate executives to live in relative safety, almost like the world's biggest gated community. Of course this idealistic dream did not exactly work out and the city fell into the same kinds of conflicts that were going on everywhere else in the world. Corporate competition was no longer competing on price, it was competing on the battlefield. These tensions eventually culminated in the death of Richard Knight who was the founder and CEO of Knight International, leading the city to be renamed in his honour. Purely from an economic perspective, Knight City has many similarities to Hong Kong. They are both special economic regions, they are both very business friendly and these similarities extend down to the fact that the head of each respective area is a CEO rather than a mayor or a governor. But perhaps the best real world equivalent would be historic European free cities or communes. These were medieval cities formed not by government or nobility but rather by a collection of merchants that needed a safe and facilitating area to conduct their business. These historic entities tended to develop a de facto set of guidelines based around the fact that everyone was there to do business and violence was bad for that business. 
Nevertheless, the same kind of corporate conflicts that drove the storyline of Cyberpunk also plagued these ancient city-states. Places like Venice, Genoa and Pisa came to be defined for the business they accommodated rather than the governments that ruled them. Now, on the topic of effective leadership, we would be remiss if we didn't mention the issues surrounding the game at launch. Given massive performance problems with the game, especially on last generation consoles, Sony has offered full refunds on all orders done on their virtual store while also removing the game from sale. For people that haven't been following this closely, this is truly a massive business decision. Cyberpunk 2077 was easily the largest game release of the year and it was launched just before Christmas after several delays had pushed the project back so many times it basically became a meme. This decision will see Sony give back tens of millions of dollars while also forgoing millions more in sales that would have been made online in the lead up to Christmas morning. This is more business than economics of course, but perhaps there is still a valuable lesson to be learned. Most of the blame for these issues has been directed at the game company's executives, which pushed out what was obviously an unfinished faulty product to a market to meet quarterly sales targets needed to see them nice fat bonuses. This certainly can't be excused by consumers that were not given the product they were promised, but there is a little bit more of a foundational issue. When working on projects, deadlines are important. It's all well and good to say we have all the time we need to develop something perfect, but perfection is unattainable, and the longer a collective project gets drawn out, the bigger and more bloated it inevitably becomes. Various teams want to add this feature and that extra storyline, and by the time one component of a swelling project is finished, another part needs to be updated. It might run contrary to conventional thinking, but not many projects involving this many people are made better by taking longer. Timeframes need to be realistic and adhered to. This goes for everything in business, not just video game development. But as I say this, I should also apologise to our patrons over on Patreon for this preview not being up a full 24 hours early. I had to rewrite the script, partially to add this chapter here about the game's development issues. So if that's not severe hypocritical irony, well I don't know what is. But anyway, now it's time to put Night City on the Economics Explained National Leaderboard, and for what it's worth, another city-state is currently top of the list, although of course Hong Kong does have the disadvantage of being grounded in reality. Pesky reality is also a problem for creating some of these ranking figures because normally for consistency we use GDP and population figures from the International Monetary Fund, but unfortunately they haven't spent the time capturing these figures for Night City yet, so we're going to have to work this out ourselves. GDP is going to require a bit of reverse engineering and we're going to have to make some assumptions about consumer spending habits 50 years from now. The average rent in Night City varies wildly from poverty stricken beggars renting coffin sized apartments aptly named coffins for around 200 euro bucks a month all the way up to executive penthouses that rent for at least six times that. By taking this and assuming that around one third of wages are spent on accommodation and applying a high income genie figure of 0.9, which looks reasonable for a dystopian corporatocracy like Night City, we can find household income is 5.4 billion euro bucks a month or 65 billion annually. When we convert this to US dollars, which hovers around $2 for every 1 euro dollar in 2077, this gives us an annual household income of 130 billion US dollars, which to be honest is actually pretty pathetic. If we looked at household incomes to GDP ratios in modern day city states like Hong Kong and Singapore, which are roughly 1 to 2, this would give Night City a GDP of $260 billion, which was way less than I was expecting and gives the nation a 6 out of 10. A few things to consider is that given all the turmoil in the world and minimal government intervention, inflation is not as strong as it has been in recent decades, so these nominal figures are pretty close to what we would have here in 2020. Another thing to consider is that a very large portion of Night City's business dealings go hmm, unreported shall we say. If we were to include the black market, I have no doubt this figure would be far higher. It's also possible given the cramped conditions that people just naturally spend a smaller portion of their paycheck on accommodation, which would give us a larger GDP figure. Now, with a population of 6 million people, this breakdown would give Night City a GDP per capita of $43,000. Again, given how advanced some of their technology is, I was expecting this figure to be far higher, but I guess a good portion of the city does live in extreme poverty, so it shouldn't be too surprising. Either way, this is in line with modern day nations like Germany, Belgium and Canada, so it gets an 8 out of 10. 
Stability and confidence is also quite hard to pin. If we were to compare it to its peers in 2077, it is a relatively solid beacon of corporate solidarity, where business comes before needless destruction. But the world in 2077 does not set a high bar for this category, and since this list is to compare nations in the modern day, we really can't ignore the flagrant corruption, criminal activity, and acts of corporate violence that are commonplace in Night City. So it gets a 3 out of 10. Growth. Again, this is quite hard to pinpoint. But given that this city is five decades into the future and only just going toe to toe with its modern day peers, it's safe to say that economic growth has not been fantastic. It gets a 2 out of 10 because at least the mega corporations look to be getting richer, so woo. Finally, industry. Well here is where the natural advantage of being set in the future really pays off for Night City. Even the poorest members of this society have access to technologies that are unimaginable to us today. Cybernetic enhancements as well as an internet that puts what you're looking at right now to shame means that as compared to any other current economy, it needs to get a 9 out of 10. Only losing out one point because a lot of these technological advancements have been used for destructive purposes rather than productive ones. Altogether, it gets an average score of 5.6 out of 10, which is not great, and puts it here on our list. Where it will be taken back off because, well, Maybe I will start an Economics Explained leaderboard for fictional economies one day, but for now it was just having a bit of a laugh playing around with some silly numbers. Hi guys, I hope you enjoyed the latest video. If you did, please consider liking and subscribing. This video is made possible by our patrons over on Patreon, so if you enjoy these video, please consider supporting the channel like these awesome people did. Thanks guys, bye.